live from the studios in Vermont <laughs> and Kentucky, it is the Nerdy News Crew with Chris, Zach, and Jay. Man, look at us sounding professional as shit. Trying I'm over to. here trying to do things and like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready for anything in my life. <laughs> Whew. I'm, hey, I'm, that was beautiful I'm definitely going to have to upgrade to a stream deck because trying to do that all with mouse clicks is a little bit tricky, especially with doing the music and everything else. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, yes. Uh, welcome one and all back to another Writing Nerdy special news edition. Our weekly news roundup with a variety of Writing Nerdy hosts. Uh, the one you cannot see is Chris. And the other two of you introduce yourselves so people know who you are. Take it away, sir. Hi, I'm Jay. And I'm Zach. So what is our breaking you, news doing, of Jack? the day? We have we have breaking news. Sir, sir. Oh. I wasn't aware we had breaking news. Hmm. <laughs> I thought that was the whole point of whole point of doing this thing. Oh, I don't know. I thought we were gonna start with a burning question. <laughs> Do you have a burning question in mind? No, because I fucking forgot it. Because just like Chris, I forgot what I was doing today. That's all right. I got one for you. <laughs> all right. I was thinking about this earlier. Uh, so, what do you guys have any sort of sentimental memories uh, with any kind of game? Like, what would you say is like your most fond, like closest to your heart memory with a video game? And if you need me to go first, I can. If you need a second to think about it. I mean, the answer is I definitely do. But Jay, by all means, please kick us off so I have time to think. Okay. So we're going to go all the way back to 2007. <laughs> uh, my fondest memory with a video game, if you can believe it, SmackDown versus Raw 2007. Those games, as ridiculous and stupid as they are, some of my fondest gaming memories are literally just me and my brother using the create a wrestler feature, which by today's standards has such a limited capacity for customization, but just the, the whole, it, it goes to like couch co-op, you know what I mean? Which is like a thing you don't really see anymore. That's and, a sad uh, thing too. And it just like, just doing like hell in a cell matches with my little brother as like, oh, I'm picking Undertaker, I'm picking Stone Cold, you know what I mean? Like, to me, that is like my fondest memory, because that's at, at the end of the day, that's what it that's what it comes down to is like playing these games brings people closer together, and so you know, that's what I think about when I think about, uh, you know, the social aspect of playing video games. That, that, that's a pretty good one. That's a pretty good one, Chris. What about you, dog? And, well, I was, I was gonna have you go next. Oh. No, 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 no. You, 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 no, no, you so first. I, after you, I no, insist. No, no, I, I insist. No, no, I insist after you. No, 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 no sir. No, sir, right, fine, I fucking. insist. All right. Um, so I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a do a two-parter here because uh, two reasons. Uh, one, my first introduction to video games, I mean, other than like Super Mario Brothers way back when, um, was uh, with my dad playing uh, Game Day 98. I think it's 98. Oh, it was it was 99. I was about to say, man, that I, wow. <laughs> it was, I forgot how long was, they've been uh, doing game day games. Well, they don't do game day anymore. Oh, that's right. They actually, they don't do they. Oh man. No, I think Dude, that's, was, that's very cool. That's, that's a, re that's a, a unique yeah, memory that yeah. I don't have. Yeah. Cause, uh, it, um, if I'm not mistaken, it had the bus on the cover. You know who the bus is, don't you? Uh, Jay, you ought to know who the bus is. I know Chris doesn't likely. Uh, no, I, I, I'm not a huge... Well, as as the fact that I didn't realize game day wasn't still being made attests to, I'm not the biggest uh, sports fan. Jerome the Bus Bettis. Oh, yeah. Jerome Bettis, <laughs> yeah. There's, you know, there's a new bus in the NFL, the uh, the Gus bus, <laughs> Gus Edwards. But, yeah, Jerome Bettis. That's, mm. So w was your dad a big gamer? Uh, no. Uh, surprisingly enough, even though he had like Mech Warrior for DOS and a handful of other things, um, I think he was, I think he was almost swept up in the technology of it all. Because if you stop and think, you know, in the '90s is when things really started booming. 
and so we always had like this new piece of technology coming in i remember when we got our first dvd player and he about died because you could see such a stark quality difference and um it was uh it was interesting but we we played we played the living hell out of some game day we had every game uh, we had game day 98 99 2000 and i think that was where we stopped with that but that's we awesome had those. there's for me there's such a huge age gap between me and my father i don't think he's ever like my dad has never held a controller or you know uh, unless he was taking it away from one of us, you know, but that, that's a, that's a, that's a really cool, like I'm jealous of that experience. That's pretty cool. It was, uh, it, it, it was fun and frustrating at times <laughs> because, you know, you know I'm, talking- here, I'm, I'm just wanting to do stupid stuff. <laughs> right. The technological boom of the nineties. We, me and Brittany just recently did a rewatch of Sopranos and the whole first season of that show revolves around them making their money uh pawning off like stolen dvd players and it's so funny to go back and watch something like that where they're like oh, these, <laughs> these dvd players these are gonna make us rich and it's like this was <laughs> what year did this come out <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i mean it's funny too because think about it because it used to be a dvd player would run you a real pretty penny um, yeah right i mean especially like yeah, blu-ray was, players were the same no too when they first came out that's I've, I have mm-hmm. told this story on the podcast before. That's how I got a PlayStation 3, because it was honestly the best bang for your buck if you wanted a Blu-ray player. Because at the time, I really just wanted a Blu-ray player, and the best quality one out there was the PS3. So I got the bonus of being and able to play was, games on my Blu-ray player, too. That was a genius business decision on their part, too. It to really was, because by the time anybody else made a standalone Blu-ray, Blu-ray player, player. It, it was almost the same cost yeah. as a playstation 3 like right. it was very very close so it was like for an extra i think it was like an extra 50 or 75 bucks you were getting a full-blown gaming console so it was kind of a no-brainer and a web browser because the ps3 had right. the, the web surfing capabilities mm-hmm. built in yeah i forgot about that it did didn't it yeah no it was um, it was a wild piece of machinery i, my, so I still second, have mine it still works great 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 console uh the second part would be um uh shortly after we're going to get deep here. So after my parents divorced, you know, I'm a teenager. I'm left to my own devices. It is what it is. God damn it. Um, but, uh, is when I discovered, I actually enjoyed gaming and, uh, I found the uh, game Prince of Persia in the sands of time. Mm. And Chris probably remembers when I went in that rabbit hole. Oh yeah. And that was when I, that was when I really, really understood that games could tell more than just you know be a game it could tell a story and everything like that and it was like i love this and i want to be about this now <laughs> right you know i never i never messed with the prince of persia series too much but i i know what you mean there's a there's like a turning point where you're like oh this is more than a game this is a this is like an art medium you know what i mean yeah well it's not even just an art medium it's a it's a little piece of escapism it's a mm. little bit. It's a little bit of a lot of things when you stop and think about it. I mean, you can really get in depth and meta with it, but um, yeah, there's there's a lot of aspects of gaming that go under the radar due to you know just people not knowing. Yeah, right. I mean, it and it's just it comes to a lack of understanding too. I remember yeah. what's funny is we talk about story driven games. Uh, Mass Effect was that for me, you know, of like, oh, this is like a beautiful story. I remember when the first Mass Effect came out, uh, and there was a huge campaign against video games for violence and various other things. Sex. Mass Effect 1, <laughs> yeah. Mass Effect <laughs> 1 was painted uh, specifically by Fox News, but it was yeah. painted in the media as a quote unquote sex simulator. Yes. And. I know Chris hasn't played it yet, but Zach, you've played Mass Effect, and it is definitely Anything not a sex but simulator. A sex simulator. <laughs> it has it has a very PG, soft PG thirteen uh, depiction of sex. Yeah, at least in the if, first game. Even if you even them. want to consider that, even if you right. want to consider it PG thirteen, because I'm I, I've seen some PG movies go right. It's harder. very tame. 
Well, I mean, yeah. in, in fairness, too, PG used to be just about anything goes except for uh, blood and gore in the extreme. And the F bomb. Uh, and the F bomb. What up? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was been just, held for a long time. The, the, the rating system <laughs> changed between the 70s and the 80s. Because if you watch some of uh, uh, Clint Eastwood's old spaghetti westerns, uh, there's full blown nudity in those, and they only have a, a PG rating. Um. I remember one of my favorite movies as a kid was Airplane, and that that's yeah. rated PG. Yeah, and there is there is complete like that, that, uh, from the was, waist up female nudity in that movie. That that was hmm. that was one of the uh, uh, additions to the rating system. A little bit later was mm-hmm. <laughs> was that, and actually defining R a bit better. Uh, and not just having essentially <laughs> GPG and NC-17, because uh, that's kind of what it used right. to be. All right, Chris, so, Chris, what about you? Uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, 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 let's well, walk all over. We, we, we got this. We got this, Jay. We got this. I, you know, <laughs> I, could, I could honestly talk for hours. Uh, I know both of you know that about all of my, my various gaming experiences. I've, I've been a gamer since a very young age, and in fact, I, I credit my grandfather with getting me interested in computers in the first place, because he had uh, the first computer kind of in the immediate family, because I, I grew up right next to my grandparents. And so my, my grandfather, who had worked at the National Weather Service as a meteorologist, and so had gotten his introduction to computers there, because they were using, uh, you know... A, nice. The older older machines, and then even by the time he left, we're starting to get into more of the kind of uh, smaller desktop style machines to use for predictive weather modeling and things like that. So he was very interested in the technology and how it had changed his career, you know, over the 20 years he worked with the National Weather Service. So when uh, personal computers became a thing, my grandfather got a Packard Bell uh, DOS machine and taught me how to use command line and a variety of other things so I could I could uh, open up my dinosaur paint program uh, at the you know the ripe old age of 3 I knew how to do basic DOS command line to be able to, to go from C That's drive cool. to B drive which was the it was the hard yeah. uh, three and a half inch floppy yeah. drives not the floppy floppy five and a quarters although I later had games on those that was the A drive the three and a I half inch B being- drive I forgot being taught by my dad how to start up that old jazz jackrabbit. I always forget about that game. Yeah, and that's so that that was my my intro, and then from there it was just like all kinds of stuff. I got introduced to like um, uh, freeware games and other stuff like that through uh, America Online. Castle of the Winds was my first introduction to RPGs, uh, which that's that's a game you can still pick up. It's really hard to get it to run on modern computers now. Uh, but probably my most uh, nostalgic memories honestly come from playing the Nintendo 64 because that was the first, like, um, as much as I love my Nintendo, the N64 was the first system that I owned when I also had, like, an allowance. So I was able to actually add more games to the collection, rent games from the from the rental places and things like that. So that was kind of my first uh, taste into video game freedom in a way. And so, you know, it was, it was playing things like... Uh, or borrowing cartridges from friends to play Mario and Zach, you and I played the Living Daylights out of Pod Racer and Rogue Squadron. Uh, same thing, kind of with you, Zach. My dad loved flight sims, so he and I played Rogue Squadron together, uh, just taking turns uh, between uh, lives, essentially. To and we played, oh, we played uh, yeah, that yeah. entire Old, game uh, and beat it. Gold medaled the entire thing too, so we could unlock bonus levels and, and other stuff. Uh, and it was nice. Uh, so, so what you're saying is your dad was a completionist. Uh, I mean, yeah, only because he liked the game so much. That wasn't him normally, but um, it was it was the flight sim things, and that's probably my favorite memory of playing computer games with my father. Was again when I was very young. I think it was only three or four. My dad had an Atari, and had an F fifteen Strike Eagle game on his Atari, and the Atari was already old and kind of falling apart by the time we played together. <laughs> And so he, he would fly with the joystick and actually fly the plane. And my job was to mash the aging and barely working buddies buttons on the Atari for flares and chaffs when we got launched on by uh, surface-to-air <laughs> missiles. Uh, so it, it was a hilariously fun experience that I loved a ton because it was, you know, he would... We, <laughs> which this is funny because it's one of these like really strong memories I have, which I don't have many strong memories when I was very little. But, you know, essentially gunning down MIG Alley and my dad yelling flares 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 and like me just mashing <laughs> mashing the f key on the atari so he wouldn't get shot down <laughs> you know so was, so that was fun yeah, especially cuz I, I i like aviation so much that was that was our little you know he was the pilot i was the radar intercept officer on the uh, on the f15 strike eagle 
<laughs> that's what it's all about. That's yeah, that's man. definitely the the gold I was trying to hit with that question. Is like <laughs> everybody's got those memories. You know what I mean? Everybody's oh, got yeah. that that sweet spot of like this is what got me into games, or you know this is my favorite part of my life as a as a nerdy kid with a game console <laughs> and i've been really lucky with a lot of those too because there's there's quite a few of them that you can still play these days either with dos box or emulators or with patches that people have lovingly put together for old games on the internet like i uh, just rediscovered not rediscovered but finally got working i should say uh, one of my favorite star wars games which is a puzzle game called yoda stories uh, in, in fact, I'm actually probably going to stream it on the Right and Nerdy channel at some point, too. <laughs> it's it's not a very complex game, but it's one that I had a demo disc for and remember literally just playing hours at the family computer of Yoda stories, just hours and hours and hours and hours for fun. So, yeah, it's, mm. I don't know, it's good stuff. Gaming's definitely been a huge part of my life all growing mm. up, and I, I definitely am a firm believer in, um, you know, the, the, the idea that as long as it's balanced, you still got to do other stuff with your life. But it is a it is a good way to, you know, uh, hone some reflexes, learn some problem-solving skills. And uh, it can, you know, it's it can be a fun way to learn stuff as much as it is entertainment and escapism and, and good storytelling. It's, 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 a, it's a very, it can be a very good hobby. God, yeah. man, you guys have been reminding me of all kinds of some old games because I had, like... Uh, the Magic School Bus Explores the Rainforest in 97. Oh, yeah, like oh. all those like Broadcom educational games. I think it was Broadcom. They they did a whole bunch of, of neat stuff. Strategic Simulations Incorporated, they did a whole bunch of great historical games. Sierra, back when Sierra still existed, uh, did a bunch of great uh, both RPGs and like historical simulators. You had Sid Meier's, who, of course, is still a big name in gaming with Civilization. Uh, and you know some of the big studios got their starts back then. Hmm. I mean, hell, Blizzard right. even middle '90s, you know. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. No. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Actually, because I remember, um, damn, what was the name of that that game? Um... <laughs> Champions. Champions Return to Norath. Oh yeah, right, right, right. And uh, I remember playing that one in high school. Uh, playing it with a buddy. That's where I discovered I love I love uh, the barbarian attitude attitude towards things. Damn, <laughs> this is more like a, a nostalgia reminisce episode now than it is anything else. Hey, I mean, if that's what you <laughs> wanted to, be, you can go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> well, before we go down that rabbit hole too far, then let's go ahead and talk about what we got to talk about. Um, let's do it. So, first, last week, uh, you know, we'd all had some minor interactions with uh, Warhammer Plus on Warhammer TV, correct? Right. And we said, you know what, this is not really going to suck nearly as bad as, like, the community is saying it is. Well, one week later, I can officially tell you, other than I am dying for more... um, shows to come on it's got a lot of promise uh, right and that seems to be that's that's the number one complaint i think so far with most people is that it's like it's it's what um five episodes of animated uh series and then um i'm not sure how many episodes of painting tutorials and the uh lore master and stuff like that because i haven't i haven't uh three so i haven't i haven't dove into those yet but um i think that's most people's complaint is just they they're so used to being able to binge all this stuff that now they've kind of hit the bottom yeah and it i mean it's you know and we said this last week it's a it's a brand new streaming service and it's a brand new streaming service from a company who this is like their first dive into this you know what i mean so obviously it's gonna be a patient thing it's a brand new streaming service too for a company that has no interest in licensing other people's works they're doing their own Mm -hmm. so that they can't be like a netflix where you know netflix could launch and have connections well first of all they started as a video rental business they were essentially just virtual blockbuster uh and so you know they're setting up their agreements in the same way uh and then slowly built up the streaming library 
because remember that was I mean that's the important thing to remember as ubiquitous as Netflix is now that was an incredibly risky move when Netflix launched because they were competing yeah. against Hollywood Video Blockbuster you know all the other local video rental stores and everywhere else you know, they were they were bucking a tried and true trend that was never in air quotes never going to go away um, so right you know when <laughs> and that's you got what they know. Yeah. If if I could just make a side point about Netflix, as frustrating as it is, as many people that complain about like, because you know Disney Plus does the approach of one episode a week, and it looks like Warhammer is going to be doing that too, where they're like, we release a little bit more every Wednesday. Once upon a time, you had to catch your favorite show the day and time it came on, and if you missed it, you were just fucked. Yeah. And a lot of people don't remember when Netflix first started out, they were. Uh, mailing you they were mailing you discs in those crappy paper sleeves and if you wanted to watch a show they would send you disc one of season one of Frasier and then you watch that shit and then you gotta ask for disc two so yep I feel like a lot of people should tone down the criticisms a little bit as far as <laughs> release schedules well dude especially because you remember you would get disc one of season one of Frasier and it would be scratched to hell and gone and exactly. it wouldn't work on your, you know, at this point, the cheapest DVD player that existed on the market. So it didn't have good lasers and all that other jazz. And so you'd have to, or, you'd have to call Netflix and be like, hey, guys, this disc does not work. I did not break it. You guys are giving me broken. Uh, you guys are giving me PTSD from when yeah, I was no, working I at Movie Gallery. Because well, I was working <laughs> at Movie Gallery when Netflix really started to take off. And <laughs> our, our line of thought, or not our line of thought, but our... Um, our our um, motto basically was like, yeah, you can go with them. They won't be around long though. We'll be here. Wow. And then right. it was like, ah, man, it was probably like six months after that is when they started liquidating all the assets. <laughs> now I remember I got uh, I got one of my favorite uh, uh, science fiction movies that way. I got Moon from uh, from a, a closing movie gallery. <laughs> Love that movie. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good one. Uh, it's a good one. Probably that 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 could say that was <clears throat> not that I was looking forward to the demise of the movie rental business. I really wasn't. But if there's a bright side to it, that was the bright side. Was I was finally able to get quite a few movies that um, I had wanted to buy but hadn't had the budget for because suddenly they were being liquidated faster than people could get there to get movies and games. But right. again, though, that's still. It, it it's to Jay's point though of um, this is the way everything's gone and you know younger generations probably don't really even identify with the fact of having to go to a store and rent a movie nearly as much as we did because it was a big deal growing up to go oh, yeah. do this thing and now it's like right. my favorite IP Warhammer has their own app that from the comfort of my own home I can watch whatever it is I want to watch right like now admittedly there's a slim pickings on selections right now um, personally I think they may have rushed the release just a shade that I feel like they maybe should have waited for them to hey if they're going to do the slow burn which they've been doing slow burn on everything for the past couple of years and it's worked for them like insanely well because it it builds hype right so it's like orcs how long have i been talking about orcs now oh about four weeks straight mm, yeah well they've been in my been sphere there. sphere of uh influence here for a lot longer than that Oh, I, I thought. Sorry, I thought you meant just the uh, the waiting for them to come into stock port portion of. No, the no, no, no. I'm talking that, about that's been about four weeks of like every week. Yeah. That's your news. Is the orcs still aren't here yet, guys? Don't worry. I'll let you know as soon as they drop. <laughs> I'll let you know as soon as they're in my cart. Um, I, might, I might have been they put out a tweet for that. <laughs> Models have been obtained. Um, can we get can we get an official orc watch like countdown timer? <laughs> Here we go. Well, it's it's <laughs> <laughs> um, but now it's like uh, that's what they've been doing is this slow burn of like, hey, this is coming out, but they're not telling you when. And so it's like this little tit, like bread breadcrumb tidbit style of information until finally, bam, here it all is. And um, 
I suspect they're going to do it this way, and I feel like if they're going to do it this way, they should have maybe have released with four shows. Right. But that's the uh, the inner binge watcher in me. Um, well, that I, it almost feels like they might have anticipated this a little bit with the the figurines, right? Because in order to get one of those figurines or models, you don't you have to have a year consecutive subscription, whether it's yes. monthly or you pay for the annual package. Yes. So it's almost like they're saying like, hey, we know this is going to be a slow burn for a year, but if you hang in there with us, you're getting a free miniature. Yeah, which is, like I said, it's brilliant. $60 for a year for, but really you're paying only $30 for a year because 30 of it's going to that mini. And mm. it is, it's, it's, it, it's brilliant marketing on their part, really. Um, because, hey, we do this thing, so let's offer you something for free that is... It's, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. Um, I watched the battle report um, for the orcs and blood angels that they just posted up as well. And I really like the nice. way they handled that. It is um, very smooth... And seamless transitions between what they're doing. It's a top-down overview of the table for the most part, but they also have somebody else with a camera going around taking like highlight pictures, and then they're supplementing them in. So if there's like there's a big fight between a war boss and a blood angel lieutenant, and they're standing up on a piece of terrain ready to go at it. It was like, it's very thematic, but they've got the camera down there for it. So switch it from the top view to that. The top down tells you what phase of the game it's in, what turn it is, uh, points and this, that, and the other. It's, it, I, it's a lot, but it, it's pretty fucking cool. <laughs> um, it sounds like it. I'm going to have to check it out. I'm about to say, I've only had a chance to listen to part of the battle reports. I haven't had a chance to really watch them yet. So I'm, I'm yeah, looking watch, forward to being able to do it. that. That's probably on the docket for this weekend. I can tell you for watching for 45 minutes now, admittedly, it's something I'm vested in. So it was super entertaining to me. But it, I didn't, like, that, that 45 minutes just went like quick. It was it was entertaining. Um, I feel like the main so if guy. You had to... Sorry, go ahead. I was I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I was going to ask you if you had to ballpark because I've I've obviously I'm I'm new to, to the Warhammer world, uh, and I'm I'm purely lore at this point. You know what I mean? I'm reading through the right. books, but if you had to ballpark the amount of time it takes to get through a tabletop game, a one v one game. What would you put that at? It depends on the size of the game. You know, I can right. not, we could, me and a buddy can knock out a 500 point game in maybe 30 minutes. There's not a lot of moving pieces. You start going up there. It's, it's almost like it goes up exponentially because a thousand point game can last anywhere between an hour and two for us. And so they're uh, doing, and, they're doing a thousand points on the battle report, right? Yes. And then a 2,000 point, which is the one I find the most fun, can last... The last one to play, which we ended up having to reference a lot of things, so there was a lot of stoppage, but it, we started at 1 o'clock, and he left here at 5. Woo-wee! <laughs> so... <laughs> so, so you would say it, it, this would be an endorsement for how well they've edited down... Oh, yeah. This- they, they, they easily cut probably about at least 30 minutes out of it. And that's a good thing, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, or it's a good thing. You a lot of what see all that. Oh no, because a lot of what they're doing, what a lot of what they're cutting out is the movement. Mm-hmm. And since she was playing orcs, she had one blob of orcs at twenty eight uh, twenty eight models for the unit. That's just one squad. You know, you got to measure six inches for that movement for one. And then you've got to move all twenty-eight of them six inches. <laughs> gotcha. So it, it's it's not it's not like what they're skipping over. They're actually fast-forwarding through for the most part. 
or they're still talking about what's being done and they'll go to like one of these scenic shots of like you know the captain and uh, captain or the lieutenant and the uh the war boss like standing there and it'll be like rotating around them while they're talking about what's happening around them um the one thing that i didn't care for and i i suspect this is uh this is the the main guy um but it, the uh blood angels player didn't seem to have the same level of energy as the orc player which she just came on for that and i mean i guess i mean jay you're more mellow than all of us combined <laughs> so i mean i guess tone is a thing but it was just like the the energy didn't match and it was like kind of interesting right like right i get what you're saying like, uh, that would probably be me in my first uh match i'd probably be like well what am i allowed to do you know what i mean does it have yeah. more of a like uh does it have a role-playing element where you can say like i'm gonna take my soldiers and uh they're all gonna climb this rooftop or is it a little bit more strict where you're like you have to engage you can only move here is it kind of like are there parameters or do you kind of improvise yes and no um when uh jay my buddy not you jay but the other jay um right when we play we tend to go more into the role playing it's like you know if uh and it's not just a like a gimme moment either but say he's got he's playing tau i'm playing chaos space marines so i'm heavy melee oriented he is not but he gets locked into melee and it's like oh no i'm gonna take this guy out or whatever and he rolls just terrible i'm like no dude dude do that again right like no that that was that was not the correct amount of energy roll that again (laughs) um as far as movement goes you have like infantry models have six inches vertical and this that and the other right so in order to let's say there's a six inch tall um like box you want your guys to get up on top of and they have to have the movement to be able to reach the top so if they only have six inches they have to move to the base of it then the next turn they have to move six inches up I got um you. unless they have like flat keywords so yes you can um i can tell you i got a obliterator stuck on top of a building once um <laughs> now, 24 inch range seems like a pretty good range until there's nothing within 24 inches and you can't move this fat fucker down <laughs> um I was like, oh, man, I'm a deep strike this guy in, which is a thing where he starts off the table and I can bring him in at the end of one of my movement phases. I'm like, I'm going to bring him in and I'm going to set him right here. And he comes in and it's just coincidental that I had a lot of good roles for everything else. And so I took everything out in front of him. You know, he was in on that. And then I was like, oh, no, I have nothing else to shoot. I hope he comes this way. (laughs) (laughs) um but so no i think it's a really good representation it was also a really good representation of how shitty roles can be and also how really good roles can be um for orcs specifically orcs have a lot of dice they roll and they're not always successful their shooting is typically horrendous but that was something that they skipped over was when she had to roll 48 um, two hit rolls so she charged her boys in and had to roll 48 of these sons of bitches so it like fast forwarded like skip frame for this that and the other until it got through to the important bits it was it was um, it was also enlightening because uh, there is a rule in the core rule book that specifies you cannot just move into engagement range. You have to charge another unit. But if you consolidate, you can move, you can move into engagement range with another unit. 
The only bad thing is, if they haven't attacked this turn, they can attack you. <laughs> hmm. But that's that's 40k in a nutshell. Um, what about you guys? What are you? What are you? What are y'all's thoughts on? I guess the slow burn here, because obviously, I think we all, I think we're all on the same page that this is, this doesn't suck. It's not gonna suck. Well, I mean, here's I mean, we haven't even touched on the actual painting thing because the painting faces one is a, I think it was a 28 minute long video. Hmm. Now that seems like an absurd amount of time for teaching somebody how to paint something, but I could go, I could go for 28 minutes just trying to teach you how to wet blend. Right. So that, that that's a far and above beyond the like five minute videos they used to do. Yes. And, and and what I will say is okay, it's sixty bucks a year. And you get a miniature. A miniature that if you were buying it at your local game store would be sixty bucks. Let's be honest. They're they're large nah. they're large sculpts. No, they're not. They're they're there may be oops. One of them is a large sculpt because it's got a big base, but the orc war boss is not going to be too much terribly bigger than this. Yeah, but still, I if mean, that came out as like a commander, that would still be like at least 20, 30, 30 bucks, though. This is a commander. That 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 is my Terminator Lord. That is a $35 model. Okay, so there we go. So I overshot it a little bit, but so still. So now you're paying 30 bucks for an entire year of a subscription service that's going to be putting stuff out and getting a model. So, like, if you think of it that way, one, this is, I think, and I'll, I'll be proven either right or wrong by the end of the year, you know, within 12 months, I think this is really good value right now for what the price is. If they do anything like what other streaming services have done, uh, like, you know, Netflix has increased its prices. Netflix increased its prices very slowly for existing subscribers and made it more expensive for new subscribers. So, you know, I mean, not that whether or not Warhammer does that uh, you know I know that g Dub stuff gets a bit more expensive the longer we go on so for the I model see at them, least I could see them not doing the model thing again and that is essentially yeah. raising their prices uh, that's kind of what I'm thinking is I think it's it's worth to get on the ground floor now they at least do it for a year if you got the money to spend partly because um, what I've seen so far I, I've, I've enjoyed and like you're saying, the nice part about them also putting on the battle reports and the painting tutorials, they're able to produce those with high production values, um, which especially because they're wanting to be able to highlight the Citadel paints and you know all of their other um, vertical integration brands that go with Warhammer. It makes sense for them to want to be able to spend more money on lighting and you know uh, planning and content creation there to make videos both that will be entertaining and also that will be really useful to hobbyists who then are going to go out and buy their uh, miniatures right so like Corvus Belly Infinity does this uh, by partnering with artists uh, I forgot the artist's name which is to my discredit but there's a couple of artists that Infinity has worked with that uh, they released just two books that explain all of their techniques and literally how to do an exact replica of all of the quote-unquote official paint jobs of all the models. So if you want your models to look exactly like the box, they have I don't want essentially them to look like the box. No, I know, and that's the thing is it's it, which makes total sense. But it's because of the way the lore with Infinity is, it, they're not set up in chapters quite the same way. So like, there are people who just want to be able to paint exactly what the box version is, and so it goes into the details of what primer you use, what color primer you use. You know, how you're doing wet blending, dry brushing, all this other kinds of stuff. And so, you know, lots of companies already do that. What's neat about this is since it's in video format, uh, it, it's a lot easier to show three-dimensionally how you're painting. You're not, you're not stuck with a bunch of still images, which still images well done can show a lot of detail, but it's not a video. Now, yeah. the There's, counter uh, argument some to anything... Instagram. Like, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. There's some there's some uh, painters on Instagram that I follow, and they'll they'll do like step one, step two, step three, whatever. And by the time I get to like three and four, and I'm like, what 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 did you do? 
I, I, I don't. I mean, I, I can tell it looks better, but what did you do? No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and that's what I was going to say is counter argument kind of what I'm saying is there is a lot of people who are already out there doing this kind of stuff. Uh, although uh, there's always um, room for more people in that community to show their painting techniques and stuff. Obviously, Citadel has their people who know exactly how to paint Warhammer the official MVP stuff for the website. So if they're sharing that kind of knowledge, I think that knowledge is worth doing the streaming service for. Um, yep. You know, uh, in addition to that, all the animation and stuff is really cool. And I would love to see them do more of it. And I'm more than willing to risk, uh, at least for, for me and my budget, a paltry $60 to see how this pans out in the next 12 months. Now, I will be absolutely fair, much like with Cyberpunk 2077. If I'm not watching this thing once a week or a couple of times a week or every day, by the time 12 months comes out, I'm probably not going to renew. So, But they've got, they, you know, I've decided to do the 12-month runway. I get the miniature that way, and that gives them time to, to, to essentially win or lose. So I say go for it. Yeah, I mean, right. it's, a, it's, it's a good solid go for it. What about you, Jay? Did you got some final thoughts here on this before we swap over to Chris's? Uh, I mean, we're we're kind of in the same boat where it's like, right now, I feel like, I feel like canceling right now would be jumping the gun. <clears throat> I mean, yes, they've been a little bit slow to roll out some stuff, but it's uh, at the same time we're kind of watching at a slow pace. I mean, like I like I told you guys, we haven't even watched uh, what little there is on there right now. Uh, we're taking our sweet time with that. So, I mean, as far as I'm concerned. Right now, it's not an issue, but like Chris was saying, if we get, you know, a few months into this and then it feels like, if it feels like you're just paying a monthly fee for an episode or two, then it you kind of have to ask yourself, well, do I want to wait or right. how loyal do I want to stay and, and keep giving them my money while we wait for more stuff to come out? Well, there is a new show supposed to start this month, if I am not mistaken. have to... I can't remember which one it is. That there's a new one that's supposed to start up this month as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I still don't even know what all of the shows are going to be. I do not either. Uh, and that, for me, that that that's part of it. Is I want to. I don't want to go in with a a bias of like, oh no, I'm super hyped for this, and then it goes a completely different direction than what I had in my head, and I'm not happy with it anymore. Right. Um, and that's that's just me. That's something I have to do. Um, I, I'm I'm just bad about that. You know what? Actually, now that I'm thinking about it too, with Warhammer Plus, you also get, um. Damn, what uh the the um white dwarf. Uh yeah, I was wondering what that is. I remember seeing that was that included, is an old magazine. Wasn't... Or it's not old magazine. That 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 it's been a it's a magazine that's been around for a long time. Um Gotcha. I was about to say, yeah, uh used to see lots of old copies of White Dwarf at the various game stores I used to go to and uh comic yep. stores. And I am trying to figure out now how to access that because I cannot for the life of me remember. But so yeah, also, White, White Dwarf the, uh, is to... Warhammer app? Yes. I was going to say White so Dwarf like, is to Warhammer what uh, Dragon Magazine uh, used to be to Dungeons & Dragons. I forget if Dragon Magazine is still in print or not. So what, what, re, what, what value does that hold to reread now? White White Dwarf? No, no, no. They're they're right. still doing. Oh, okay. Yeah, these are concurrent episodes or concurrent issues, not. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, I misunderstood yeah, no. too. I thought you were saying that like the archive was open. No, up, so I, you have I, access I, to it now. You, you do. For like the ones that have been released this year. Um, they come out with rules. Uh, they they used to come out. I don't know if they still do, but they used to come out with uh, missions that were very much narrative and one-sided like it would tell you that you whoever's doing this is not going to win but this is a recreation of x battle and x thing 
That's it would tell you how to build the armies and things like that. Um, but it also had like army showcases and stuff. Um, so they were more about the meta of the gameplay more than the lore or anything, right? No, it was both. Because was there saying? were there, there was um, there's oh, okay. um, there's a lot of short stories in there. I mean, dude, there's it. I have only ever found it at um, Barnes and Noble once or twice. But let me tell you, that, that magazine is like thick. <laughs> oh, okay. I am trying for the life of me to figure out. I'll have to do some research Sunday. I'll sh- I'll be able to tell you. Uh, we'll give up on this for right now. I'll tell you Sunday. Um, but now there, that that's why I'm like, man, this this is like a huge value because I keep remembering things that are in this subscription that I forget about. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you get the Warhammer app, um, which would help me immensely because my dumbass forgets to look at things if i can pull it up right here and just be like oh, mm-hmm. here it is right um but it, that gives you access to all of the old books now the new ones they don't do so like the value of the app seems to go down over time but like you know with something like tyranids that have an eighth edition codex you pay for that you ain't got to buy the eighth edition codex and you've got it again it's another i think five dollars a month or three dollars a month actually i think is what that one is but you get that included with your warhammer plus subscription nice so like like i said there's there's a lot of value to this it's more than just the shows. And I think that's what most everybody, even myself included, get hung up on is because this this is a form of media that we're not accustomed to from Games Workshop. Right. Um, Chris, do you want to touch on uh, your cyberpunk? Yeah. So, yes. Um, give me just a minute here because I'm pulling up, I'm pulling up my... Uh article to make sure I've got everything correct here but the yeah the gist of it is this is some pretty exciting news especially for me uh, is that um, cyberpunk uh, CD project red uh, has uh, decided to hire a group of uh, modders to help both with modding support for cyberpunk 2077 and also to help improve some aspects of the game's back end. Uh, and this, uh, I think, came out just a couple of days ago. I'm referencing a PC Gamer article, if you want to uh, fact-check me here with this, and that'll be the primary source I'm using uh, for this story. Uh, so, yeah, so what... Uh, and this is the... Uh, uh, yeah, here we go. The PC Gamer article that was written by Andy Chalk uh, a couple of days ago. And so what the gist of it is is that uh, CD Projekt Red has announced, announced that they are hiring the uh, studio Yigsoft, uh, which is the modders Blumster, Nightmare, and R. Fuzzo, who have been uh, working with the uh, main modding uh, kit that is out there, not officially supported by CD Projekt Red, uh, but is called Woven Kit. And Woven Kit's uh, open source uh, modding tool set that is meant for Red Engine games. So, in other words, uh, Witcher 3, Wild Hunt, and Cyberpunk 2077. Uh, so, so yeah, um, CD Projekt Red has announced they're hiring those guys on, and uh, from what they have been able to share, that is the Yigsoft guys have been able to share, is, and I want to make sure I actually quote this directly from the article, let's see here, where did I find it? Uh, da, da, da. We uh, Yeah, that we will be working on various projects related to the Cyberpunk 2077 back end and the game's modding support. We are really excited for this and really hope we can bring Cyberpunk 2077 to the next level. So so that's pretty cool because one of the you know, major complaints with the game by a lot of people is the lack of um, features that you know, were either implicitly or explicitly promised that didn't launch with Cyberpunk 2077. And as I know that you guys can attest to, uh, and what we talked about just a couple of weeks ago with the um, modding episode is there are plenty of games that have released in a troubled fashion uh, that have been saved by the modding community, and there's plenty of grade A games 
that have been made even better by the modding community. Uh, Skyrim being an excellent example of this, same with uh, uh, Morrowind and uh, also with you know games like anything based off the Quake 3 engine with how moddable it was. So I'm really excited about this uh, myself primarily because uh, I haven't yet gone back to pick up Cyberpunk 2077, and especially if they suddenly give me the chance to mod the living daylights <laughs> out of it, I will be playing a lot of Cyberpunk because I do love a good mod because you can kind of pick your poison between I want to make Cyberpunk 2077 the game I wanted it to be or hell, I just want to have a single overpowered weapon so that when I get really angry with the game, I can just go full postal on it if I want to. You know, so. <laughs> so are you are you playing you're playing Cyberpunk on PC? Correct, correct. Is it is it a game that you would recommend to a console player at this point? <laughs> um, at, at, at this point, pro well, okay, it, it, it's that's a tricky one, right? Because well, uh, I'm not I'm not even asking in like a tongue in cheek kind of way. I I legitimately don't know what the status is as far as like how much they fixed or the launch issues. Yeah, and, and it's a game I thought about playing. I don't think I'd recommend it if you had anything under a PlayStation Five. Because it had such a gotcha. troubled launch on the on the last gen ones, they have done a lot of patching, but I haven't seen. I just personally have not researched and seen what the how the older gen consoles are doing uh, with the mm -hmm. with the updates. Um, and that's the nice part now about the game generally is, uh, sorry, not about the game generally, about the era that we're in generally with gaming is that you know with whether you're a console player or a PC player patching is now possible which is very nice because uh, it used to be back in the day you know like uh, you know, hell Zach I remember you having this problem with um, uh, Knights of the Old Republic in particular that there were game breaking bugs that could be patched on the PC and so were never a problem but they you couldn't patch the Xbox game disc and there wasn't a way to deploy patches over the internet for the console, so you were just stuck nope. working around that bug. And so that's the nice part now is they're able to patch the games live. But I think I still, you know, unless you're really, really into the game and just don't have the budget for um, a new console, which is fair enough, then maybe it's worth trying. But otherwise, I'd say wait until you have a next gen console or you have a good gaming computer. Um, or hell, even not that good of a gaming computer, because as I have mentioned before, I mean, I'm using a fourth generation i7 processor in my rig and only a 1080 uh, graphics card, not even a TI variant. I do have 32 gigabytes of RAM, well, uh, but that's played Cyberpunk you know, the, absolutely the, beautifully. The PC the PC uh, camp in the, the gaming wars, they're kind of having the last laugh right now because... Uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but consoles are pretty hard to come by these days. I'm I'm still yeah. running my original Xbox One, uh, the first gen with the 500 gigs, the pain in the ass, you know, delete something if you want to play something new console. Well, um, well, 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 hang on. Chris Chris can also attest to how long you've been looking for a uh, 20 series. I, I was about to say, it's funny that you say that because really everybody's hurting because the, the problem is with the pandemic and everything else, that has really thrown a monkey wrench right at the head of the silicon supply chain for every kind of component. Intel's having that, trouble that makes keeping a lot of up. Sense. NVIDIA's having a hell of a lot of trouble keeping up. Uh, between everybody wanting a computer because everyone's working at home now uh, to everybody wanting to mine Bitcoin, uh, there, right. we, there's just nobody can get enough of anything. Car manufacturers can't get enough chips to make new cars. That's that's how that's how crazy the supply chain situation is. So yeah, console players can't and, find consoles. Uh, PC players are in a better boat just because we've got the gray and used market to look at. So if you're just looking for a generational <laughs> upgrade, you can definitely do that. But sometimes on eBay, you're still paying a hell of a premium because the supplies are just so constrained. It's ridiculous. Right. And Wingstop is selling thighs. Yeah, that's yeah. the biggest. That's the biggest red flag to me. <laughs> the, the world's going to hell. Yeah, actually, you know what I've heard. I've, and that's one thing I've missed the most about Bowling Green. Uh, besides, besides uh, seeing my my favorite couple down there, Zach and Bethany, uh, I miss Wingstop. I used to go to Wingstop all the time, and due to the COVID supply chain issues, they've had to start selling thigh meat. And they have leaned fully into this from a marketing standpoint. And from what I've heard, it's actually really good. So, I mean, thigh is the best cut of meat on a chicken. I'm just saying. But if no, I want if, wings, by God, I want wings. 
if only there was an analog to uh, computer chips. You know what I mean? There's not really <laughs> a thigh meat of graphics cards or, well, you know, yeah. processors. Um, well, actually, yeah. actually, I, yeah, what, I, yeah. what I will say, you'd have to double check, um, but for playing some of the older games for sure, you have to double check the newer ones. Because uh, I've thought about this, and I might still do it, is grabbing a pair of 1080s and putting them in SLI. Uh, so that's kind of your that's kind of your run up is you can do some multi processing if you if you know your stuff. That's why I, I do agree with the spirit of what you're saying, Jay, and that I would rather be a PC gamer in this market than a console gamer because I do at least have the option, especially if you're somebody like me who builds their own rigs, of being able to right. to upgrade and kit bash parts together. I have enough Eventually. spares from enough computers that I can keep myself running for a good long time. Uh, and and I just I can't much. I can't go I can't go a single day without seeing scalpers who have bought you know 10 playstation 5s and they're selling them for 1200 a piece and it's oh my god you know i, I've, I got, I've got nothing against a ps5 for 1700 dollars, and i'm like what Ooh. possessed you to do that especially because you there know, was nothing out for it yet. it's if you want a 3090 ti two grand <laughs> i've got nothing wrong but like i have nothing against people that want to make a buck but like at the same time, scalping is so ugly and uh, it's just a nasty practice. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it, and it just kind of makes me when I look at when I look at a uh, an adult who's selling ten PlayStation fives for a profit, I see a guy who maybe he's trying to make money for himself or his family. But then you also see a PlayStation that some ten year old kid didn't get, and that kind of goes back to our our discussion about nostalgic memories. Yeah. You know, where's the where's the poor kid who didn't get a playstation on christmas because those motherfuckers are two thousand dollars now and that's why he didn't get one well and i mean i will definitely say uh that that's something especially with christmas season coming up just be watching that gray market even for last gen consoles and stuff because at least myself with Mm. my childhood because we didn't have a lot of money to spend on consoles and things and you know it was the nintendo 64 came out and that's when i got my first gaming console which was an original nintendo and I had a wonderful time playing those games. So, so that's the thing: is the old gen consoles do still have plenty of play in them. Uh, so that's true. That that's something to keep in mind. And old PC games have got plenty of play in them. If you're somebody that's trying to find games to get your friends and stuff for Christmas, the indie game community, you know, go check that stuff out because there's all kinds. And we've reviewed all kinds of great indie games in the past because those don't always require the most modern hardware. And you'll find some of the best gems. Uh, especially if we get stuck inside again with the pandemic ramping back up, uh, you'll find some of the best gems that way. So you you don't have to have the latest and greatest hardware to have the most fun. You just you got to get a little bit right. creative. It's it just you know just like you do with anything. So uh, especially speaking from the experience of I sure didn't have to have a Nintendo 64 on launch day to enjoy playing games. Uh, so you know that's that's just something something to think about. And like I say, my PS3 still works. So. That's that's what I do if stuff gets bad. Is if I'm stuck inside, I can still throw Rainbow Six uh, 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 Rainbow Six Vegas Two on my PS3 and and run through levels. And Great it's game, just as fun as it was the first day I played it. So <laughs> play some of that. Play some of that terrorist hunt. Oh man, yeah, that's that's look, you put, God. It's so you fucking put me on hard. Low but density I fucking on the highest game. difficulty. Can't do it. No or man, the it's... game where the Spaz Twelve shotgun was a sniper rifle, pretty much. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, they. Yeah, I don't know what kind of choke they have on that sucker, but that thing's a son of a bitch. <laughs> I, the I'm, last I'm thing convinced, you hear is I convinced they just they, Yeah, I was about to say I'm convinced they just they modeled it with turkey slugs instead of with buckshot, <laughs> <laughs> but gave it the spread of buckshot. Yeah, I was about to say uh, Infinite Warfare. A couple years ago, they had a shotgun on there that actually fired a slug and not buckshot. And uh, you talk about reach out and touch somebody. You could reach (laughs) out and touch somebody. Oh, yeah. But you had one shot. Well, so that, <laughs> if you missed that, that shot, <laughs> there I don't think they ever adopted it. But there was uh, a push at one point for the uh, U.S. military to adopt the uh, AA-12, which was a uh, could be a semi-automatic or fully automatic shotgun that had self-stabilizing 12-gauge rounds with fins that would pop out. So it could reach out to about 150 meters and could fire armor-piercing incendiary rounds. You know, that's like that's like <laughs> at a certain point. I feel like. I feel like the Nerf Corporation, they look at real guns and they're like, all right, how can we take these cool real guns 
and make them into even cooler toys. Uh-huh. And that, that A12 that you just described, that sounds like the military looking at Nerf and being like, whoa, that's a cool toy gun. How can we make that a real gun? Pretty much, man. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's funny now because like, I, was, I was actually just reading an article today about the new uh, Liberty class littoral uh, combat ships, which uh, a littoral combat ship is a ship that can, uh, in Navy parlance, can get around in brown water and blue water. So meaning it can get really close into shore because uh, it uses a jet mm-hmm. propulsion system, not on like a jet ski. But they were showing pictures of the inside, and the thing looks like the USS Enterprise from Star Trek because it's all computerized. <laughs> It, it's all like you know. It's high speed, low drag. So the whole thing, it just looks. It looks like a starship, and you're just like one of those where you're just like, huh? I think the naval designers were nerds growing up because this does not. <laughs> it, it, it's still a warship on the outside, but some of the inside shots, you're like that. I've seen that on Star Trek. That looks like the engineering spaces of the Enterprise from Wrath of Khan. Like <laughs> that. That can't be a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's well, kind of scary how uh, close the science fiction military bridge is. I've heard from <laughs> some guys that worked in the military that did, like, drone work. They say, yeah, you know, operating one of those drones is uh, way too creepily similar to playing Call of Duty and using a drone in Call of Duty. <laughs> because, Oof. you know, we're just uh, we're a generation of gamers who are war-ready, pretty much. <laughs> that's the hot take. <laughs> uh, let's start training now on video games for your future career so, in the exactly. military. So tin full hat time here. Uh, <laughs> Wally, Wally came into being because they sent forth armies of these gamer soldiers who destroyed the earth and then had to actually evacuate because we fucked everything up. I, I've I've always kind of assumed that's it. They never would really say in Wally, but like it's one of those where it's vague enough. It's either because because by the time the movie starts, it's so far after the catastrophe. That stuff is settling down, but it's like it's it's got to be like Blade Runner esque nuclear war, or it was just the environment got so bad that like we literally greenhouse affected ourselves to death, or it's it's something. It's one of those where because it's Pixar, they don't really get too far into the nitty gritty, but you can tell something awful happened. Right, you can't <laughs> you can't exactly show the, uh, it's the a mutated cannibalistic raiders. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it, it's, it's a Pixar movie. Every every Pixar right. movie starts off with something completely terrible happening no i know that's the, they at least just didn't like actually go through the entire apocalypse because there's you could reach back in in wally and p- just kind of pick your poison like for all we know <laughs> wally could be 150 years after fallout you know <laughs> like it's i mean it's not the right technology tree but it, it's it's that kind of thing it's, it, it, you know. that you know right <laughs> all right gentlemen does that wrap us up for this uh, this uh, episode of the Nerdy News yeah, with the Nerdy so. News crew? Heck, in fact, we, we went on for about an hour there, according to my streaming clock. We did. We did. So, yeah. There's only about 15 minutes longer than the last time, but oh, we could have so. gone for another 15 minutes before I stopped us. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I could <laughs> ramble about dumb shit all day. <laughs> well, sir, you are in the right podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so... This one will only be on Twitch and YouTube. It won't actually get pushed to the podcast feed. Correcto so, mundo. Uh, because I'm as you predicted, this for the podcast feed, and that doesn't mean dick. Well, but as, as 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 you exactly <laughs> predicted, I actually because we had to release five episodes this past month because of the way that the cadence was. Literally, oh, yeah? I had the podcast ready to go on Monday and did not have enough space <laughs> to upload it, and had to wait until Wednesday, literally Wednesday, Ooh. when the when the first day of the month rolled over, and then I had enough space to upload the uh, the episode. So I'm really glad I didn't do one of those DJ sessions or upload one of these because uh, we would have been hosed. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, these are these are YouTube only uh, <laughs> until we get enough until we get enough subs uh, and money that we can afford more space on our podcast hosting service. Which which brings us to the point of the necessary evil here. I mean, if you want to hear more from us, do feel free to subscribe, like, comment. You know, talk to us. You can go to the Discord. We try to be pretty active. Jay Jay is pretty good about dropping some dope forty k memes. And don't forget to uh, ring that bell, and then we'll pin ya. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's my my <laughs> forty-four club. My homage to how ridiculous there. 
love you guys <laughs> but yeah do that um chris you have anything else no, nah, that's pretty much it. You know, otherwise, just check us out all the places you can find us. Obviously, the YouTube channel, like Zach said, podcast you can find where all great podcasts are found because our RSS feed is out there. So just search Right and Nerdy in your favorite one of those. The ones we actively are posting. To- Did you already do all of that? <laughs> no, Jay posted up a meme. Oh, okay. I, I, was, I was afraid I had like zoned out for a second and was just repeating <laughs> verbatim what you had just said. No. Zach, <laughs> I don't know. Dropped a hot, fresh new meme in there. <laughs> nice. I will. I will check it out here in a second. So yeah, yeah. So check us out where, wherever you can find podcasts. We actively are, you know, always check our Spotify's, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Verbal Libsyn. Uh, but you can find us, like I can say, anywhere that picks up our RSS feed. So, so go out there, drop us a line when you're able, which will be after the fiftieth episode once our website is back live again. In theory, uh, should be live on the 50th in fact uh, we may try and coincide it uh, depends on how inebriated we all are no that's that's, that's <laughs> totally fair so at any rate soon enough www.writeandnerdy.com which is www.writinnerdy.com or as Zach likes to say it www.writeandnerdy.com that's www.writeandnerdy.com we'll be back up and operational soon and once that is up and operational you can go to the contact us page drop us a line we've got a little uh, email account set up there that we check so if you want to give us some feedback ask for uh, requests for things to cover always welcome we'd love to hear from you guys and I think with that yeah uh, I got the outro music so I am going to send us to the outro hexes where we will see you next time. Take care, stay safe, and don't have too much fun without us. Adios. Bye. (laughs) 